Hi guys, I'm here with Randy, and this is another options trading chat. The previous chats that we've had have been extremely fruitful and valuable to our audiences. So I reached out to Randy and he so graciously carved out some time in his busy schedule to sit down with us. So um, Randy, if you could please introduce yourself. Sure. First of all, David, I just wanna thank you for this opportunity. It's a privilege to me and an honor. Um, so my name is Randy Perez. My channel is My Life of Learning based on the mistakes and the lessons I've learned in trading stocks and options. Uh, primarily, I'm an options seller, but I also do buy some stocks outright. Awesome. And from reviewing some of your, and actually for a brief intro for his viewers, my name is David Jaffe. I have the website beststockstrategy.com and on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash beststockstrategy. That's the channel name. Randy, from, uh, from looking at a lot of your videos, it's my understanding that you're primarily focused on protecting money and generating cash flow from selling options. Is that correct? Yes, protecting capital would be my number one goal. And once I feel like that capital is sufficiently protected, then the next major goal is to generate as much cash flow and return as possible. Um, you have to risk some capital in order to make a return, but we can definitely maximize that return while we minimize the risk. Because that's our goal is how much cash flow can we generate by selling options while also protecting this pool or pile of money that we've set aside. And with your strategy, are you primarily selling puts on a small group of stocks? Are you selling puts on indices? What type of stocks or indices are you looking at in order to identify good opportunities to generate cash flow? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one that that I'm always trying to um, get a add to my pile of stocks that I track. So currently I track about 200 stocks looking for opportunities on a daily basis um, for potential trades. Uh, we look at the entire universe, but we shrink it down to about 200 stocks that we are willing to trade in. They're companies that have proven over time that they'll be consistently profitable in good and bad markets. Uh, their cash flows are stable. Um, I look at, you know, what happened to them in the recession, what happened to them in the COVID drop in March of 2020, and like to make sure we're trading in those stable companies. And then on a daily basis, looking for opportunities, when certain moments when we can sell options, puts, uh, maybe covered calls, or maybe some of the other option trading strategies that we use to, to generate that cash flow. And when you are identifying opportunities, are you scanning the 200 based upon their like their changes in price, like their price range? Are you looking at implied volatility rank? Are you looking at VIX levels, or maybe you're looking at all of those things? What is um what are some of the things that you look for to identify good opportunities? Yeah, there are definitely a lot of things you can look for, and. And there are a lot of indicators you can use, and it can almost be overwhelming. I've overwhelmed myself to the point where I almost didn't feel like I could make a good decision. So I've really tried to simplify uh, what I look at. And so the biggest thing I like to look at is a stock that has been coming down in price or maybe even having somewhat of a crash, but it's starting to level off. As I especially like it when it's leveling off around previous support. And generally, my interest in a stock happens on the weekly charts. I look at multiple time frames. So every weekend I'll look at all the 200 stocks that I track and on the weekly chart it's starting to come. If it's been coming down, starting to approach support, it piques my interest and I put it on my watch list. And then on a daily basis, I'm seeing, well, what has it done over the past couple of days? And again, if I'm finding it, finding support on the daily chart, then that's a trade that I'll do. And so at that point, depending on how urgent I want to get into the position, I'll look at the 15 minute and even hourly chart determine what is the best time. Should I place this trade right now? Should I put an order out there? It has a little bit better price that we get filled at, and that's how we enter those, those trades. Yeah, I, I agree with you. For me, I tend to look at, I would say about 10 to 20 stocks, and there are high liquid stocks, high liquid stocks with large market caps that have strong brands like Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft or JP Morgan, things like that, because I'm I'm in my mid 30s and I don't want a situation where where there's high beta where as you've experienced and as we've experienced over the past week or two if the market falls like 10 or 15% I don't want a situation where the stocks that I'm involved in are going to crash 40 or 50%. I think that 
minimizing portfolio volatility is one of the most important things because oftentimes people don't take into account the emotional toll that they experience with losses. And the losses are about four to five times more painful than the elation and the happiness that you feel from the gains. So I'm very similar where I look at a little bit um, a smaller of a universe of stocks, but at the same time, I give tremendous amount of weight to the trading range of a stock. And if I see that something is at the low end of its range, then I have a tendency to sell a put option anywhere from 10 to 25% below that, depending upon numerous factors. Like basically, I want to sell the highest strike price that I don't believe is going to give me a headache and that I don't believe is going to get challenged. And especially during periods of low volatility, when the VIX is trading at 15, I need to be okay with that strike to make sure that even if VIX spikes up to 15 or 30, that that loss on that option that I sold when the VIX is trading at 15 is not going to get me into trouble. Yeah, it reminds me of a, a comment I had on my Patreon this morning. A patient asked me, they said, Randy, we've been watching your suggested trades, or the trades that you've been doing. And they're like, you know, bravo, good trades. Um, can you tell me why the market's been crashing, but, you know, a lot of your, your trades have been doing good? And that was basically my answer was, well, the stocks we're trading in, they're great, solid companies. They've already come down. And yes, they can continue to come down, of course, but there's enough interest at these levels that they're kind of being held up or maybe even pushed up by the market because it just makes sense. They're great companies. So kind of along the lines of what you were saying, David. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's kind of like uh, the whole like Warren Buffett thing where he says, okay, when there's blood in the streets, then it allows you to buy great companies on sale. Yeah. And be, be greedy when other people are fearful. Do you, um, do you use portfolio margin or, you, or are you using regulation T or do you not use margin at all? Yeah, I'm a proof of portfolio margin and I do use a little bit of leverage and margin, not much. Early in my career, I used a lot of leverage and margin and it burned me several times, gave me that three to four or five times pain factor you mentioned. But now if I use margin, it's a very small amount for a short period of time. I'm not big on using a ton of margin. I, I looked at the really wealthy people I knew in the recession and asked myself, you know, what did they do right that I did wrong? And that was one thing that, that blared me right in the face was people that were really getting hurt in the recession had a ton of, of margin, leverage, debt. And the ones that just flourished, well, they may have used some debt and margin, but they didn't overuse it. And so I try and copy their examples. That's an amazing point. Two really quick things on that. The one great thing about having portfolio margin is that it kind of does provide you with free money because, and I know that, that, you know, everyone says, oh, there's no free money. There's no free lunch. However, if you're buying stock on using portfolio margin, it actually provides you with free leverage. Whereas if you're buying stock using regulation T, then they actually charge you margin interest. So if you combine both strategies where you buy stock or an index, like let's say you think that right now because the queues have pulled back like 15% or Amazon's down almost like around 20% from its previous high. If you wanted to, or Tesla, you know, right now, I think it's January 27th, like Tesla was down relatively significantly today. If you wanted to buy one of those stocks or an indice, you can actually buy those using portfolio margin and it's not going to use up a lot of buying power. And then you can sell options around that and use the long stock as leverage so that it actually is not going to decrease your buying power significantly. Okay, so that is one thing to take into consideration and one benefit of portfolio margin. The second thing, I agree with you 100% about judiciously using leverage. And um, I do think that that's one issue, especially with younger viewers who are watching this video. They say, hey, why should I be interested in protecting my money or earning two to four percent a month, you know, two, two, three, four percent a month by selling options when I can buy options and turn $500 into $10,000 or I can day trade and earn one to three percent a day. 
why don't I just try to hit home runs? Because earning 2% a month for me is not going to move the needle. What would you say to someone based upon that? Because clearly you're successful. You've been through ups and downs. And hey, we were really young too. We were 18. We were in our early 20s at one time too. So we probably thought the same way that these young people do it. What would you say to them if they were watching this video? You know, it's, that's hard. And someone who can be that disciplined starting out, they're probably going to end up being extremely wealthy because that's a, that's a lesson that needs to be learned and hopefully it's learned the easy way. There's a video that I watched one time that helped me get my head around being smart and taking baby steps. I think it's called The Man That Planted Trees. It's a thing about a 30-minute video, but it, it kind of shows the power of just slowly plugging along at investments. And in the end, you have this glorious forest of these beautiful trees that can produce fruit or whatever the trees are. And that's kind of what I like to look at. I like to look at, at the, the big game. Don't look at what's right in front of you. Don't have that tunnel vision. Look at the entire field and know that this is a long-term game. I, you know, I call it a game. I take it very seriously, but I call it a game because I, I really enjoy it. And I want to play it the rest of my life. And the people that I associate with um, and that I'm some way a part of their, their trading life, I want them to play it the rest of their life. And I want them to, to do well at it, do really well at it. And that's why leverage has to be controlled. You know, I'm not, I'm not against using marginal leverage. As a matter of fact, if the market crashed, I would entertain using not wide open margin, but I would use more because it's an opportunity. But you have to be careful because it's a double-edged sword. You know, it's, it's great while things are going good, but you and I both, I'm sure you get the same messages. Oh man, this position went against me. I'm having a margin call. What do I do? And you feel bad for them. But what do you do is actually that answer should have been answered before you got in a position because you can prevent that. No one, no one can force you into that bad position. And you just want to keep playing the game forever. So that's why it's important to me to control that margin. You know, just make what you can make, learn from it. And in time, that money will come. If you love this game, you'll figure out how to get enough money to play it on a bigger scale. It may take time, but most good things that are worth it do take time. I, I agree with you again. I, I feel like if you're targeting return, if someone comes to me and they say, hey, I don't need to learn how to make 2 to 4% a month because over the past six months, I've earned 60%. And then they get this myopia or this short-sightedness where my response to them is, okay, I hope and I wish that, that your returns continue. But deep down inside, I know that they're taking way too much risk. And then at the first pullback, at the first time that the VIX doubles in price, or you get even a 5% pullback in the market, forget about the 15% that we've recently experienced, they're going to be hurting and they're going to be losing almost all their gains. And yeah. firsthand experience, I've been approached by a few people who they traded too large when four months ago, PayPal was trading at about $310 and then it fell down to about 240 they loaded up on puts at a strike price of about 200. And then for about three months, PayPal was trading between 180 and 190. And now it's trading at around 155 because of that pullback. And I'm also stuck in a PayPal position. But the difference is that my confidence level in making money in that PayPal position is probably around 80%. And for them, they, not, not a lot of them, but a few people contacted me where they traded too large and they ran out of buying power and they will not even have the opportunity to make money on that position because they were closed out. And remember, oftentimes when you're forced to close positions, you close them out at the absolute worst time because your broker issues you a margin call. Generally, during the worst time when the market falls like over 100 points and then maybe it rallies back later in the day like it did earlier this week. And those are the worst times to close out a position because you're out of the position and unable to participate in the upside. And the reason is with every single person that I've spoken to, it almost always comes down to sizing and being too aggressive. Yeah, I agree with that. I have specific rules when it comes to sizing and and they have uh, changed over time i mean currently 
Um, my rule is no more than 5%. If I got to sign that full position, no more than 5%. But really, what I try and stick to is around 25 to 3%. That way, if the position goes against me, because some of them will, they, that's just how it works. If it goes against me, I still have an extra 2 to 2.5% two that I can sell puts at a lower price to help get that cost basis down to help improve the position. So it, that sizing is important. And I mean, no matter how right we think we are, Dave, I don't know about you, but I know several times I was just so convinced that you know, I sold it here, sold puts here, it came down, sold some more here. It's like, man, that hit really good support on the weekly, monthly, hourly, whatever. Hit all the support. So like, I'm good now. I'm loading up. Man, it just kept going. So you just don't know. For, we try to put the odds of winning in our favor. But you have to plan like you might be wrong in every trade. That's a great point. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll put on a position that you think is good enough to enter. And then you'll kind of like hope and feel it out that it goes against you. And then you'll have a full position in that specific position if your starter position, so to speak, goes against you. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. yeah usually what I do is let's say that my full position would be six put contracts i'll start out with one or two and i'll watch it usually these these stocks they, they're they're in your sweet spot for a few days sometimes they just rock it up and sometimes they keep dropping and so by doing one or two out of the six potential contracts it gives me a chance to kind of fill it out okay how's that looking so i did one today i traded a put option yesterday look looked good health support again today pop hit another one so now i'm at about three out of six potential contracts and if i'm wrong then it lets me okay it goes past my support Okay, well, let's just give this guy a minute to cool down. Let's see what he's going to do. And if he keeps going, then maybe I just sit back and wait. And maybe I don't enter another position. I just kind of try and repair that one. Or if it finds really good support below there, maybe I'll sell some more. Uh, I just find that kind of easing into trades. And what I mean by easing in is, you know, every day, look, I look at it every day. And if I can add to one that I wasn't in a full position that yesterday and it's still looking good, man, it just confirms what I was thinking was most likely going to happen. It's so funny you say that because I'm the exact same way, especially during periods when the VIX is low and volatility is low and the market I feel is overbought. I'll sell like one contract and then people will, will sometimes email me from my trade alert students. and They'll be like, how large is your account? Don't you have a large account? Why are you selling one contract on Dollar General or one contract on, on like XYZ stock? And the reason is that I don't want to be trading that often when the odds are stacked against me. And, you know, okay, yes, the odds are in your favor. You do have positive expectancy, even during periods of low VIX. The problem is that if you trade and use up all your buying power when the VIX is trading at 15, then when you're not going to be able to last during times when the VIX is at 35, you're definitely not going to be able to open up new positions and collect three to four times more premium than you were collecting when the VIX was trading at 15. Because remember, not only is the VIX increasing, the IVR is increasing, but if you have substantial buying power after a 10% pullback and after VIX is trading over 30, then that same like $2,200 strike that you sold on Amazon at 15 when you collected $5 is now trading over $20 because Amazon itself has pulled back around 10 or 15 percent. So what do, you, what do you say to people when everything's all good and stocks are going up and um, you know you're selling like maybe an occasional contract and you're just you're thinking, hey, um, I've seen this before. I'm, I'm prepared for the next sell-off. But they're saying, hey, I want to be more aggressive. like stocks are going up and I'm selling options, but you're making more money by buying stocks right now because Tesla's going up every single day. Tesla is going has been up 10% over the past two days. Like, why don't I just do that when David, you and and Randy, you guys are just selling like like a few contracts of, of puts when the stock when VIX is trading at 15 and the stock market's going up every day. What, what do you say to to those people? You know, I've I've been around long enough to know that. A big part of our success is because we found something that matched our personality, our desired level of risk, and it just kind of fits us. And so I tell people, is look, the way that I trade, it may be the complete wrong way for you to trade. I respect the way you're trading. It just doesn't match how I feel about the market, the way that I feel comfortable trading. And so 
you know, I encourage people, you find a technique that works for you or a way that you create that works for you, man, go for it. That's great. Because that's one of the big important factors of being a successful trader. But I absolutely don't allow it to change how I trade. I trade the way I, I do because it works for me and it has for a long time. And I made mistakes. I've traded ways that didn't match my personality. Or I was too risky or maybe I was a little too conservative. I've just found that that sweet spot, that sweet zone that fits for me. It feels good. It makes sense. When I look at the charts, it's I can determine within a few seconds if it's a position that I'll most likely go with or if it's one I don't want to touch. So, you know, I encourage everyone, you have something that works for you. That's awesome. Keep going. Share your story. And um, and hopefully it works out well. But I like to hear their success, but it doesn't really. I do listen to what people say to see, is that something I'm missing, Randy? Should I? Try to implement that. And if it's not, then I just I ignore it and keep plugging along. If it's something that I think sounds of interest to me, then I'll kind of figure out does that fit with who I am and who I want to be as a trader and um and wish them well. I, I agree with you. The only caveat to that is if I have people who email me and they say, Hey, I've I've made a few hundred percent by buying options or day trading, and I've been trading for six months. I don't necessarily respond back and say, hey, I encourage you to continue doing that. Instead, I look at it from like a statistical perspective and, you know, I because I, I do have good intention where I try to help them. Now, they think right. that it's skill, but I believe that it's luck. And, you know, hey, you can go to a casino and you can play, you can play, you know, any game, craps or, or whatever, roulette. And you can win, but that doesn't mean that you have skill. You know, skill yeah. is going to be replicated over a long periods of time when there is actual statistical probability and it's statistically valid. So yeah. I do think that there are some things that people engage in, whether it's, you know, buying options at like the wrong time and, and having it be like 100% of your portfolio or day trading, which has a negative expectancy which I wouldn't necessarily, if someone emailed me, I wouldn't be like, oh yeah, you, know, you should continue doing it. Cause I, I believe yeah. that, you know, they might lose money in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Do you, do you sell call options as well? I do. Um, covered calls, poor man's covered calls on occasion. That's one of my repair strategies is I'll sell a naked call or a bearish uh, call credit spread. So yeah, I, I do. I do use calls, um, not as much as puts, but I definitely use them, especially in situations where stocks been assigned to us or an expensive stock like Amazon or maybe even like a Microsoft or an Apple that I don't want to own the stock outright. To me, there's not a whole lot of benefit because the dividend's so low. I'll do a poor man's cover call. And definitely that's one of my, I call it my little secret weapons is when a position moves against me, a put moves against me, or we're assigned, the stocks crash well below our, our strike price that we were assigned at. At that point, we really work the call options whether it's a covered call or performance covered call or try and do some ratio spreads or just use those call options, you know, around resistance or just above resistance to generate as much cash flow as we can while we wait for the, the position to come back for us. I agree hundred percent. We, um, yeah, this, this is awesome. It's one thing. And I actually had a call with a student earlier today, like this afternoon, if you have a deep in the money option or you're assigned, then you can actually, sell relatively far out of the money call options and you could actually sell more now don't i wouldn't go crazy on this but let's right. say you're assigned like two contracts then it would actually make sense to sell for i would say a maximum of five that are relatively far out of the money and the reason for this is that if the underlying stock goes up by let's say two hundred dollars then on the put side, that's either deep in the money or that you're assigned stock, you actually profit the full $200 mm -hmm. per contract or per you know 100 shares. But yeah. on the call side, even if you sold four or five contracts, that call option might move against you by, I don't know, like 10 or 20 cents maximum. So yeah. just a fraction of the amount that you'll experience a loss on the call side will more than be compensated by the gains on the put side. So I yeah. think that's a, I, I definitely agree with that, you know, as a repair strategy and yeah. also during times when you believe that we're entering like a two-sided market or maybe like a bearish market. Are you, 
Are you finding yourself selling more call options now in like late January 2022? Uh, you know, I sold some towards the end of last year. I, I've noticed over my years of trading that January, not always, but January tends to be a volatile month. I don't know if, whether it's big guys are repositioning or taking profits or getting new positions. And so actually one of the trades that I've been doing the last quarter of last year was selling some naked calls in SPX. And about the, the value of my portfolio, my portfolio is predominantly a bullish or a neutral portfolio. It's not designed to really go away up in value as the market goes up. So volatility was somewhat lower. And so I've been, I run my numbers and calculations and do my little geometry and figure, okay, well, I don't think SPY is going to be up here by this date. And so we were selling some naked call options at SPX, which is 10 times SPY approximately. So I, I use that to drink some cash flow, especially in a lower volatility environment. People, they're paying a little more for call options. So why not take advantage of that? And if they challenge it, then it's time to adjust it. Like those SPX numbers are, are pretty large. They have a lot of zeros behind them. So you want to be careful with them. But otherwise, you know, when a position goes against me, I, one trade I'm thinking of is a trade we did in Amgen, ticker symbol AMGN. We have been selling the 240 puts. This is throughout last year and early in the year, maybe mid-year, we got assigned at 240 and Amgen ended up getting down to 200 and then it kind of found support. And again, I'd done one contract, so I sold another one. But I looked at what our cost basis was. It, it bounced up to about 207, 208. And I thought, okay, I bought this thing at 240. Let me see where I'm at. We're at, we we're at, I think it was 200 or 198. So the thing was down 20%, you know, pretty big money for a, a higher dollar stock. But we're actually doing good. We're up in a position that the stock had really moved against us in a big way. So, and part of that was selling a covered call, but we also did a bearish call credit spread just in case, you know, the thing went crazy on us and flew past our short call option strike price. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of using calls to repair positions, but at the same time, not being too aggressive with the strike selection, because as we saw in March 2020, there was a V-shaped bottom where mm -hmm. pretty call sellers, if they sold too close to the current market price after the market lost about 36% in 33 days, they really got their face ripped off. So be judicious when selling calls and really look at the overall market. I think that right now in late January 2022, I personally believe, and you know, it's never good to give predictions. I know I'm going to be wrong, but my personal belief at this moment is that we'll experience some two-sided markets this year, especially considering that the market was up around 30% last year. So I think that I don't think that we're going to crash, even though the market's gone down around 10 or 15% over the past two weeks. But I do think that you know having the market end down anywhere from five to 10% this year pretty much puts things aligned with the historical mean or the historical median with where they've been. If the market over the next two years closes down like 10% a year, then you know that kind of that kind of gets worked into the mean over the past 10 years and brings down the 15% back to more of like, you know, an eight or nine percent average, which is where it's been historically. So we'll see. I I have been selling more call options recently, and I think it's okay. And and when I have been selling puts, I've been going farther out of the money. And because volatility is extremely high, then it allows us to collect significantly more premium while also being more selective and more careful on our strike selection because you can sell puts in Amazon for below $2,000 right now and still collect a decent amount of premium. And in situation, when Amazon's 52 week high is I think like 37.73, I wouldn't even mind owning Amazon at 1900 or 1950. That would be that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at Amazon today. At the 2000 put, I'm like, man, you get that much for it? <laughs> I didn't pull the trigger. I want to I want to see how it ends up next few days. But I was looking at that same potential trade. I, I think in Amazon, and I'll post this after they report their earnings, but next week, I believe that they were, they're reporting earnings. So there's probably going to be a decent amount of volatility contraction in that option because risk is going to be is going to be taken out. Um, yeah. Now we'll see. Maybe you know, maybe uh, Amazon falls two hundred dollars when they report earnings, and you guys will know that if you're watching this because I don't know that now because it's before the earnings. So we'll see. Um, now you touched upon something really important. You said 
it's really vital to protect money. Can you talk about, and I've seen a, a lot of your videos, which I thought were incredibly well done about how to actually get a credit while also protecting your portfolio. Can you touch upon like some of your favorite strategies? And it doesn't have to be like done for a net credit. It can be done for a debit. Like, you know, I'm okay with that, especially, you know, especially during periods when you need to increase buying power. What are some ways that you use that you like in order to, to protect your money? Yeah, it's one of the nice things about being an option trader is that, I mean, you have so many ways you can do it. And really, they're, they're situation specific. But, you know, one of the old classics and favorites is, well, if it's gone against you and it's gone below your strike price, try and roll it down and out for credit. And that's that's always one of my go-tos. If that doesn't work, then uh, we'll consider, you know, adding a, another put if we have, if we're, if we're under our max position size. If it's fallen, you know, if you have a resistance up here and it's fallen below there, then as we spoke earlier, I'll sell some call, a call option or maybe a bearish a call credit spread. Maybe if it's a dividend paying stock, a lot of the ones I trade, they are. If it is, then I'll, I'll go ahead and let it be assigned to me, especially if they're about to go ex dividend. And I don't see, yeah, you know, I see that there's probably more financial benefit to letting it be assigned as compared to rolling the put. You know, sometimes those put options, they have the dividend already priced into them pretty much, but sometimes they don't. Just really looking at every angle and look at the situation and on some of them that are non-dividend paying stocks or low, low dividend paying stocks. And you may be a little uncertain as, you know, maybe this thing will keep going down. Well, to me, that's the perfect spot to switch over to poor man's covered call. And you get some downside protection by buying that. I, I like to buy um, leaps a year or two year out. If it keeps going down, your option doesn't lose dollar for dollar like that deep in the money put option might. As a matter of fact, as the more wrong you get, the more you're glad that you own a leap option as compared to being short a put option. And also, you know, our position was our overall portfolio was down value wise on some positions last year. And that's when I started selling some call options in SPX. You know, why not? Uh, the market's so excited and happy and we're at the top of a channel. I'll be glad to sell some call options and it makes up for maybe a couple of the positions that are down. What um, do you have a typical days to expiration that you like to target? Yeah, you know, I did a video on that weekly versus monthly and actually got really good input on it from people and they liked it. And I know some people just, they really like weeklies and then some people really like monthlies. I tend to sell more monthlies. I'm not opposed to weeklies. I, I try to keep a really diverse portfolio. I mean, we're, we generally have between 30 and 40 positions on. So we're almost always buying and selling something. Um, many days every week we have a new trade that we're doing, whether it's a sell a new one and close out one that's nearly worthless. I generally tend to like the monthlies. Uh, they tend to have a little higher open interest and be a little easier to get in and out of in some of the stocks that we trade in. But I'm, I'm not opposed to trading shorter time frames. Like right now, I am still trading the, the uh, third Friday of February. I think it's 22 days out right now. So that's right at three weeks. I'm still trading those because the return is, is good. And if, and if I'm trading in a position that is going to go, they're going to announce earnings right after that expiration date, I'd rather trade and get out of it before earnings are announced. That way we can you know, avoid that possible uh, crash on us. So somewhere in the 15 to 40 day range is usually what I like to do. Yeah, I I like, I would say similar, like 15 or 40. Sometimes I will go out, like during periods of like high volatility right now, um, I will go out as far as like 60 to 90 days just because I want to capture that premium. Now, at the same time, sometimes if um, if the volatility in the back month could actually be lower than the volatility in the front month because there's an expectation that volatility will fall, then that also comes into play. But generally speaking, if I believe that the market like right now, if it'll stabilize, I wouldn't have a problem going 90 days out and selling a put option on Amazon at 1900 or 2000 and then just basically sitting on it. And then once volatility contracts, I would then close that position out early and maybe I'll end up being in the trade for like 30 days. So yeah. I think it depends upon the situation. My default tends to be around that 30 day mark, but depending upon the situation, then, then I will go further out. Yeah, I like that. So I understand that you have a lot of experience in real estate as well. And I wanted to ask if someone is really young right now, because trading options is great for cash flow, but if this person has like a really small account, even if they earn 3% a month, 
on $1,000 or $2,000. It's not necessarily going to move the needle for them. Although I do think it's important, similar to what you touched upon, about building good habits and being very disciplined. And, and you know, you can establish those habits at a young age, and that's going to pay, you know, that's going to, it's going to make you very wealthy later on. But what are yeah. some things that someone can do if they're like 18, and they are really interested in trading and selling options and, you know, being long undervalued companies, but they don't have a lot of money. And maybe they are interested in real estate. Can you give them some advice based upon your experience? Sure. You know, and there's actually a lot of similarities between real estate, especially rental property and trading options. They both hopefully would generate monthly cash flow for you. They both are investments that have structured properly, can appreciate over time. I, I think real estate is a great way to generate wealth. If if you happen to start from almost nothing, real estate is a, a really good way to do that. Once you have some money or, or as you make money, I encourage people to set some aside, just put in your account. It'll be, amaz it'll be amazed how just putting up 50, 100 bucks a week or whatever you can a month, um, it'll slowly pile up. And if you make good, stable investments, then at some point that little, that little pile of money turns into a little bit big pile of money. And then you have enough to start trading in a somewhat diversified, smaller account. Now, one of the things I'm doing with my Patreon group is I had several people in there or quite a few that have smaller accounts and they're like, Randy, you have a big account. You know, <laughs> I don't have that big of an account. What do I do? And so I actually, a lot of my retirement was tied up in real estate until several years ago. I, I had some money in the market always, but I had a lot in real estate. And so I've sold off some so that I'm more closer to 50, 50. And I spent, I started a Roth account uh, probably two or three years ago. And it, it's getting close to 30,000, I think it's around 27, 28,000. And I just been buying stocks. Uh, ones that I thought were, you know, had the possibility of going up, paid a dividend. And then this, just this week, liquidated it and said, okay, we're going to treat this like a small account. Here's how you trade a small account. But it all came from over the past several years, putting that little $115 a week in there. And it finally got big enough to trade it. So, I mean, real estate's a great tool and I love depreciation. If it wasn't for depreciation, um, I probably wouldn't be doing real estate now, but I, I do still own rental property. I am still buying some, buying one on Monday. I love ops trading. It's just so much, it's, there's just less risk. Uh, you get a lot of the same benefits. You just don't get that depreciation right off. So if you're looking to start from scratch, real estate's a great way to do it. It's something that you should look into, read on. There's so much free information out there that it's definitely an asset class that I think a, a younger uh, person with a lot of energy and a lot of ambition that uh, they should learn it because it'll it'll do, do well for them. And for people who might not be as like tax savvy or as experienced with real estate, when you mentioned depreciation, I assume that you're referring to the tax write-off that you get from the depreciation of the properties and the assets as well. Is that correct? So it offsets some of your profits and then you can depre you can reduce your tax basis by the amount or your taxable income by the amount of the allocated depreciation based upon the depreciation schedule. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so real simple and easy way to look at it is let's say you bought a $100,000 rental property and may, maybe a lot of it or almost all of it was financed. So you didn't really have to come out of pocket really anything to buy it or very little. Let's say you wrote that thing off over 25 years. So 100000 divided by 25, you're writing off $4,000 a year. Well, when you figure your net cash flow on a rental property, you know, that's probably not too far off from what you truly net after management, maintenance, expenses, uh, taxes, uh, all your expenses. You'll probably walk away with four or five, you know, thousand dollars. So basically you're making that four or $5,000 tax free because, because you bought that hundred thousand dollar asset, you can write off a hundred percent of over 25 years. And that's not the true number, but let's just say that you can write off $4,000 a year against any income that you made to speak of. I'm not an accountant, so verify this, but you can use that $4,000 and avoid paying taxes on $4,000 of your income. So basically instead of you pocketing 70, 60% of that $4,000 because you had to pay the rest in taxes, you pocket the whole thing. I mean, that you want a pay raise? That's a that's an awesome way to get a pay raise. Wipe, wipe them taxes out legally. You had mentioned when we spoke earlier about, you mentioned something that I found really interesting about rental properties where the, you, you said something, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You mentioned where like you're basically getting paid for your time and they're working do you remember what it was that you told me? It was like very, it was very powerful. Yeah. So, you know, if you have a job, 
then the best you can do is 100% of your abilities. 100% of your time is the best you can give. Whereas let's just say you had 10 rental properties. You have 10 tenants. Like our, one of our requirements is you have to make three times the monthly rent and income to rent this property. What that means is that these 10 tenants that this person, this investor has, they're working a third of their week for you, for the landlord, because they're giving you a third of their money. And so instead of me working 100% for myself, I'm still working 100% for myself, but now I have 10 other people that are working a third of their time, a third of every day. So what is that? Two, three hours a day? They're working for me. And then you can see the leverage you do that times 20, then 50, and 100, and the numbers get really interesting and fun. Yeah, I think that's great. All right. Um, I think that's that's pretty much it. I, I found this call and this conversation to be extremely enlightening and, and also extremely valuable. And I believe that our audiences will also find it valuable as well. And do you have anything anything else that, that you want to say? Anything that I forgot to ask? I don't think so. I think you did a great job. I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate what you're doing. I really enjoy your videos and your channel. Um, I like listening to intelligent, wise, and battle-proven option traders like you. So I appreciate it and appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be with you on here and look forward to continued success and having a great 2022. It's going to be a fun year. Thank you, Randy. So Randy, Randy Perez with My Life for Learning. Do you have a website? You, you mentioned you have Patreon. Yeah, we have a Patreon. The link's in the description of every video, uh, various levels. Um, from really inexpensive to on up, you get alert. As soon as I know a trade goes through, you get it. Um, and I also have a website, mylifeoflearning.com. But Patreon is probably the best way. And here on the YouTube channel, I, I look at every comment. I try and reply to every comment for all possible. So I'm a, a day or two behind, but do my best to reply and, and read every comment. And for me, I have an education course and then also a trade alerts product, which allows you to follow my trades. You can try it out for $19 for seven days. And if for some reason it doesn't exceed your expectations, then you can easily cancel. So it's very low risk. Yeah, I, I really hope that you enjoyed this chat with David Jaffe and Randy Perez. Our goal here was to add as much value as possible and we appreciate you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you, David. Take care, everybody.